Stanford University. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Jason Lenetsky, the director of the Anderson Collection at Stanford University, and uh, I'm ex super excited to be here with all of you. So thank you for coming. Thank you for, for your patience. Um, it's been a long haul. Um, you know, I really want to welcome you to the first Anderson Collection at Stanford University public program in over 18 months. Um, I should clarify that that's the first in-person public program. Um, we've done some wonderful online digital programs um, during this period of closure, but it's so nice to be back. Um, this is such a beautiful night to be gathering. This is such a beautiful place to be gathering. Um, and I don't know, I couldn't feel luckier than right now being here with all of you. So thank you all for being here. Um, as I said, we so appreciate your patience during the closure. Um, in order to open, it took the Anderson Collection staff an incredible amount of work, time, energy, and commitment to this museum, to Stanford, and to this collection. Um, they did all that they could to care for the building during closure, to completely reinstall the galleries, um, and to prepare the museum for your safe return. I'm incredibly grateful to all of you um, and really excited to welcome all of you here back. This is a really exciting time for many reasons. The academic year has just begun. Classes started on Monday and I'm thrilled to extend a warm welcome to our students who are here with us tonight. Um, I had the opportunity on Wednesday to bring a class through the Anderson Collection um, to see Eamon's work, to see our permanent collection, and it reminded me just really why it is that this museum is here and we are a part of the campus. It's so great to be a part of the academic world um, and already and just walking through the gallery with the students on that day I learned a lot, so thank you. Um, you'll have a chance to hear from some of them later. Um, we hope you students, that, um, that you know, the museum is a place that you find comfort, that you find joy, and that really contributes as a resource to your learning experiences here on campus. Um, I'm also really excited because, as you know, the Stanford Art Museums are fully reopened, and that includes the Cantor Art Center, um, which has a wonderful new exhibition on view. For those of you who haven't yet seen it, please see Paper Chase, 10 Years of Collecting Prints, drawings and photographs at the Cantor. Um, it's a wonderful exhibition curated by Elizabeth Mitchell, um, and it's not to be missed, so please come back to see it. Here at the Anderson Collection, I'm delighted to present a complete reinstallation of our permanent collection. You'll find many of your collection favorites installed in new ways and alongside new works. Um, this current installation brings together works from the New York School and the Bay Area figurative artists um, and shows new pairings between artists such as Helen Frankenthaler and Sam Francis, Richard Diebenkorn and Willem de Kooning, Clifford Still, Peter Volkis, and David Park, all not to be missed. Um, and speaking of David Park, I'm so grateful for a recent gift of a David Park painting to the Anderson Collection. It's on view for the first time on the second floor. It's a beautiful small oil on canvas painting titled Untitled Portrait of Tom Jefferson from 1957. Um, it was a gift to the museum by Keith Jansen and Scott Beth. Um, and I am so proud to have the painting there and I hope that everybody takes the time to go and see it. And to mark this special moment and share new perspectives on the work, we've produced a small collection of essays about the painting um, by some of the authors who are here today. Nancy Boas, who's a biographer of David Park, um, John Seed, who uh, is an alum of Stanford and a former Anderson Family Collection intern, um, and Helen Park Bigelow, who is an author and a poet and uh, a daughter of David Park. Um, and that the, all those essays are collected in a digital format and they're available um, by scanning a QR code in the galleries and also through the museum's website. So I'm grateful to all of the authors and to the donors for uh, making this possible and for creating opportunities for us to expand research and teaching and scholarship um, through the gift and through the writings. So thank you. We also invite you to experience two powerful installations 
addressing troubled histories and current events, reaching towards warmer suns by the artist and Stanford alumnus Keon Williams and Hostile Terrain 94. Um, Keon's piece is in the front of the museum, Hostile Terrain is on the first floor. Both of these works came to us through collaboration with academic departments, faculty and students here on campus. Um, and I encourage you to spend time with both of those works. They're incredibly current and timely and powerful um, and they're very re rewarding if you give them the time. Um, we'll have upcoming programs related to both of those installations uh, this fall and into the winter. We're thrilled as well to share one of our newest exhibitions, Sam Richardson, Islands, Ice, and Sand, in view, on view in the Wish Family Gallery on the first floor. The show takes a focused look at the finely crafted small-scale sculptures or sectional landscapes Richardson made in California in the late 1960s and 1970s. Seeing them today amid the backdrop of extreme weather events, drought, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, we have an opportunity to reconsider the land we live on, the place we call home, and the impact we are having. The museum is grateful to Sam Richardson's family for their encouragement of the exhibition, and in particular to Sam Richardson Watts, the artist's grandson, for facilitating a number of loans and providing unlimited passion and guidance on this project. You'll all have the opportunity to meet Sam Watts, um, on October 15th when he comes to present a public program out in front of the museum. So uh, please join us then. And tonight, we're in for a real treat. Eamon Ore Heron is here as a visiting artist with Stanford's Presidential Residency for the Future of the Arts. Our invitation to Eamon was made back in the fall of 2019, and I'm delighted with his patience and his understanding uh, that through thick and thin museum closure, a trio of wonderful online programs last fall, um, and his spectacular exhibition on view this, um, this right now, that, uh, <laughs> that, that we're all here together to experience it and to see it. The residency is a collaboration with uh, Stanford's Institute for Diversity in the Arts and Stanford Arts, and I extend great thanks to my colleagues at both of those departments. The exhibition would not be possible without the lenders who generously shared their remarkable works, the Cantor Art Center for their loan of the commemorative reproduction of The Last Spike, the support of our museum members, and the efforts of the museum's incredible staffs. In particular, I'd like to thank Jean McDougall and Mark Shunney, who oversaw exhibition coordination and installation, Amy Shapiro and Ileana Tejada, who made tonight's program such a success, and Urmi Sheath and Sarah Larson for their incredible membership support. Eamon's work draws on motifs from indigenous and craft traditions, such as Andean tapestries and pre-Columbian gold work and architecture, as well as aesthetics from the 20th century avant-garde, including suprematism, neoconcretism, and futurism. As I hope you have experienced through the exhibition, Eamon's paintings confront time and space. His works are, in and of themselves, a record of time, of ideas, and marks made thoughtfully and intentionally over many years. His work is about ritual, remembering, movement, and intersection, presented in ways that reveal and reconfigure cultural and visual histories. The exhibition encourages close looking and self-reflection, a reassessment of our shared histories and future opportunities to align and better connect our past, present, and future. Amen. we're all honored to be collaborating with you and providing access to the intellectual resources of Stanford's campus providing you opportunities for engagement with students and faculty and the community, um, hopefully throughout this academic year. Um, and later in tonight's conversation, Eamon will be joined by two Stanford students for a question and answer um, before inviting you, the audience, to ask a couple of questions. So please help me in welcoming Eamon Ore Heron. Thank you so much. Um, it's kind of amazing to come out of what we've all been through and to see so many faces all in one place. So I want to thank the Anderson. I want to thank Stanford, um, Putter, and all the people that have helped make this happen. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's really, it's taken um, a concerted and collaborative effort um, and we I personally at least I will say speak for myself wouldn't couldn't be happier so thank you for your collaboration and partnership 
Um, it's been a journey, you know, we've been on it for a little bit. We talked to, in, you know, 2019, um, I think I originally suggested that you consider creating a mural sort of painted on the wall at the top of the stairs. Yeah. Um, and uh, you thought about it very kindly and very kindly declined. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I'm delighted with what ended up there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I understand your, your reasoning around questions about permanence and temporariness and all yeah. of that. Um, and so I'm happy, very happy with where we landed. Yeah, <laughs> I am too. I am too. Um, and so, you know, the creative road that you've been on is a long one and an exciting one and one that I think holds great promise for the future. Um, you know, along this road, you've delved into obviously painting, but music and performance. Um, you've lived and worked in places including Arizona and California, Mexico and Peru. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think these have had various influences on you. Um, your Infinite Regress series um, is one that you started in 2015. Um, and as I mentioned, for this exhibition, you've created a site-specific um, large-scale painting, the one that is now at the top of the stairs. Um, as well, for this exhibition, you've uh, debuted a new series of paintings, the Black Medallion paintings, um, that um, are really stunning and, 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 and exciting. Um, and I'd love for us to be able to talk about all of this, but maybe we can start just talking about Infinite Regress um, and understanding from you a little bit about your inspiration, um, what drives you to continue the series, mm -hmm. and you know how, how you think about it. Yeah, I, so it is interesting just in terms of um, like walking in there and seeing hostile terrain and seeing the border, seeing Tucson there. I grew up in Tucson. Um, so there was just a lot of interesting little kind of moments in which I realized, oh, yes, this is probably like a place that I was meant to be um, to, to do this exhibition and this specific time in terms of like the pandemic breaking out and, you know, changing the vision of what what was going to happen instead of a mural. <laughs> um, and so when I was thinking about this exhibition, you know, the Infinite Regress is a, a series that I've been working on for the past six years, seven years. Um, it was started in 2015. Um, it comes out of a, a, a bit of a personal experience of loss and, and losing somebody very important to me, but at the same time uh, witnessing the birth of my, my first child. So it was, you know, to me, painting is very like, it's like alchemy. You know, you, you're kind of inventing things. You're, 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 you're grabbing different materials and you're, you're putting them together and you're, you're formulating this language. And so the infinite regress kind of came out of this rupture in my life. And, um, and this motif kept appearing in the work. And so when we talked about, you know, doing this exhibition, you know, I, I'm still pretty deep in that um, body of work. And I, I felt like, you know, the, the, as I've, as I've kind of traveled through this process of making this series of works, I've thought more about the material. And as you'll see in the text in the exhibition, the material gold, what is the history of gold? You know, and, in, in, in thinking of that alchemy as like a painter, you know, to me, the material of gold really stood out in terms of like my own history, in terms of my inspirations of Latin American abstraction, um, and so so that's that's I don't know I'm probably meandering a bit, but the infinite regress really has been a voyage. You know, it, it started with something that was a bit more of like looking for some sort of way to crystallize these emotions and feelings and i think that that's like in a lot of ways that's what painters do um you know inventing this type of language um but but as as it's gone forward it's really moved into a deeper investigation into material history um and and you know like you had said earlier to connections you know connections to my past uh, to place um, and 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 all of those type of those issues essentially. Yeah. 
with the connections, uh, I mean, are you seeing new connections being created over the course of the time that you've been working on this series? Um, or you know, current experiences that are influencing the direction of the series in new ways or unexpected ways? Or? I do, and you know, like we, you had mentioned earlier too, you know, I've worked in music, I've, I've done performance work, I've done video work, um, and so it is interesting to embark upon a certain series in which it requires a lot of dedication, you know, and to watch something just slowly transform. You know, and and to see how, so this piece, the piece that you see when you walk up the stairs, um, to me, that's a bit of kind of hearkening back to some of the first pieces in the series that I started in 2015, and I believe this. I'm I'm almost losing track of the number, to be totally honest, um, but I think we I think it is uh, 100 and. 83? Three? Yeah. yeah. 183. Uh, in Roman and, numerals. And, yes, which... in Roman numerals. Woo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, you know, when, I, when I'm up in this kind of evolution in the series, looking back at number one and two is always like an adventure, you know, and, and kind of thinking about what I was going through at that time. Um, you know, just thinking about what you're saying in terms of influences in music, I, you know, I, in having had the opportunity over the last couple of weeks to spend some time with the paintings, I feel much more of a sort of sonic experience with them. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And maybe part, in part it's sort of a, um, a reflection of the gold or like a reverberation of, you know, sounds in the galleries off of the, that large canvas. Yeah. Um, but I think there's also a rhythm within the composition, um, you know, the rays of, the, the geometric rays of, of light that are emanating in a way, um, what appears to be motion of these circles and discs, um, and all of that kind of has a little bit of a sonic quality. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, I, I feel like I, I get the same feeling when I'm, when I'm creating the pieces, almost like xylophone mm. type of uh, tunings. You know, like a painting has a tuning, you know, and I think of those kind of keyhole sections as, you know, the, the, the orbs that are kind of passing past them are almost kind of ringing across them, you know. Um, I do listen to, like, minimalist composers, so I think there is definitely some resonance in that. Um, I also love repetitive tones and, um, you know, I think... Uh, working in music, there is, you're dealing with repetition and the subtle variance within that. And in painting, when you dedicate yourself to a series, I think you kind of take on that same kind of responsibility to the painting and to the language that you're creating, but also like you're engaging in that, that sort of repetitive act. And when you remove something, you know, like in sampling, like when you're making music, you remove something, your brain fills that in, that empty space. And I think, I kind of like to think of the paintings doing, functioning in the same way. Like when you look at the raw linen, it is in itself another element of the painting, yet it's not really worked on at all. Yeah, yeah it's, it's nice to hear you mention the raw linen. Um, just this evening when I was in the gallery, I was speaking with uh, some of our guests, and they brought up this question of the, of the linen yeah. um, and the sort of blankness of it. Um, and they noted it, and we can get more to the gold, but they, they, they saw the piece of linen that the gold objects themselves are sitting on and um, felt that there was a connection perhaps to, mm -hmm. the, to the painted yeah, linen. absolutely. Um, and I think that, that those open areas in the paintings, um, the unpainted areas, really sort of add breath and vibrancy um, to the experience. And I mean, and in a way, they, they connect to artists in the Anderson collection um, that we aren't showing you know, with your work, but color field painters like Helen Frankenthaler, mm -hmm. who applied, applied pigment to canvas and sort mm -hmm. of um, allowed that materiality of the substrate to be an integral part of the work and the yeah. experience of the work. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think those pieces, those gold pieces are, are to be kind of viewed in relation to the gold in the paintings. And the, the connection that I'm asking the viewer to make is um, there's a long history when we look at those objects and there's a troubled history, but there's also potential for like reinvention, you know, and I think in terms of gold and, and I know that that was probably going to be the next question, but like, you know, in terms of gold, when I think of gold and, you know, when I, when I kind of, um, as I started to kind of analyze the material more, I thought of gold as this in its raw form is very random. It's just the asteroids colliding into the earth and they created it, you know, and us in, in Latin America, we have a tradition of understanding it as excrement of the gods and and then when you know there's just all these really interesting layers of like how you can relate to this material and so these three objects you know the spanish coin is a coin that i purchased um from a it's a from a uh, sunken galleon the coin is from peru i believe it was pressed in 17 15 or late 1600s um and then the replica of the golden spike unfortunately we couldn't, couldn't get the or, the original one it's in there it's over there <laughs> yeah but, um but um but it, that, that well so that that represented you know california yeah you know and so the coin is peru the the spike is california and the necklace is cocle, which is from Panama. And so to me, it was kind of like this interesting way of, of connecting this hemisphere through this material. And also like quite literally on the gold spike, there is this statement of conquest and manifest destiny, you know? And I think as, as a painter, that's kind of the history that I'm, conjuring but it's also the history that i've lived and that i've experienced yeah i think you know um the inscription on the gold spike on the on the face uh that that is upward facing on the surface that's upward facing speaks about um the unity of um the unity represented by sort of the the driving of this spike connecting the two oceans um, and um, there's, you know, there's a lot of power that comes with that statement. Um, there's a lot of power that comes with the idea yeah. of the railroads, you know, crossing America and kind of unifying them. Um, and I think there's a lot of question about what, how is unity defined and how is unity thought of maybe differently now, 150 years later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and, and also I, I think labor you know the idea of this object is like labor it's a spike and um and then the cochlear necklace is um it's the embodiment of creativity and beauty and and then the coin is a bit more of a, a uh you know within that coin potentially could be peruvian masks you know, that were melted down and pressed, you know. So when we're looking at these objects and when I was talking about like the asteroid, you know, this like raw form of gold, it, it's still in its moment of transformation. Just because it's the gold spike right now doesn't mean that it won't be some other thing in a thousand years. And the same with the Spanish coin. Um, and, and I think like this is iteration number one with that coin. It's a very small coin. <laughs> um, but it's, it's more of like what it represents is, is somewhat of like a liberation of material. Um, and so iteration number one is to introduce you to this coin that you've all looked at tonight. And it is in its, in its state uh, a, a, 
emblematic of the colonization, you know, and and then what I plan to do with it is to transform it in many different iterations. And so this is iteration number one. Um, on the coin is stamped the pillars of Gibraltar, and um, it says P U A, but it looks like a V, you know, the Roman U, um, and that was stamped on all Spanish coins, and that was plus ultra America. That's what it meant, and it meant that this coin came from outside of the Mediterranean. Um, and the the pillars of Gibraltar represent the Mediterranean, the gates of the Mediterranean. Um, and so that's the title of the exhibition, pl non plus ultra, is to plus ultra. I mean, this could get a, a bit. No, go for it. Okay, okay. Go for it. Plus ultra is is currently still the Spanish, the motto of the Spanish um, national motto. And it, it is a response to what was written on the pillars of Gibraltar, which was non plus ultra, nothing beyond this point. When Charles V took over the Western Hemisphere, uh, colonized the conquistadors in Latin America and the Aztec Empire and everything. Um, he, his his response to it was plus ultra. We we're gonna get rid of the non plus or non. We are, we're going beyond, and it still is on the flag of the Spanish flag. Um, and so, in a lot of ways, the title is to kind of reassert like you know a, a limit, and to push back on these ideas of um, expansion essentially. Um, and to look, think about expansion in different ways, possibly. And I think that that's what we currently are kind of experiencing in some ways, you know, in our, in our modern condition. Yeah, and I think, you know, um, I think you as an artist, as a creative individual, helps to play a role in um, providing opportunities for us to think differently about uh, accepted definitions or generally perceived and understood histories. Um, and I think, um, you know, maybe this sort of leads me to a question about this new series of works that you're embarking on, the Black Medallion series, which um, for those of you who have seen them um, are devoid of gold. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, the five works that are on view at the museum now are the first five that you've done in this new series. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you were very intentional in wanting to show those with, uh, with the Infinite Regress series. Um, and I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear you talk a little bit more about the origin of those, uh, of the Black Medallion works mm -hmm. and, um, you know, sort of how you see them in relation to Infinite Regress. And, and the gold pieces. Yeah. So, you know, thinking, thinking more about gold and the material and its history, um, I'm a big fan of, of De La Soul, especially their old, older stuff. Um, it's a hip-hop group from the 80s. Um, and they have it, this one line kept repeating in my head as I was listening to it was, uh, black medallions, no gold is like, is, is a phrase that's that's mentioned in the song um, buddy is the song and it got me just thinking about like what that person is saying right there is like and I and I'm thinking about that time period and it's like you know the Malcolm X medallion the Africa liberation medallion, these black leather medallions to replace, it was like a response to the, the, the um, gold bling culture, you know, and, and for me, I really like identify with that. Like I come out of that era, I'm very, that formed so much of my thinking when I was younger. And, you know, so I, I thought, you know, if I'm working on uh, in this infinite regress series with the gold and what is it to like prioritize this other color? You know, what is it to like replace the, the value? Um, I mean, we've, we've done it in our currency and like, so what if in this series, like there's a way to replace the value of the gold and 
so working with with the black medallion series it was a it is a a a, a way of kind of doing that engaging in that and and quite literally especially in this exhibition i think having those gold objects and having this whole conversation about gold and then the black medallion is this this response to that like putting a priority on value in a in something that is you know a community that is is much um uh, uh what am i what's the word i'm looking for like a more marginalized yeah. community like a community that doesn't have the gold you know and and, and w w what is our agency in that you know and so you know th there's a lot of other kind of formal things that occurred when when introducing gold and replacing i mean black and replacing the gold um and and you know i think in terms of the collection i thought how do i how do i place this work in dialogue with these really epic pieces and artists that i completely have always really loved you know per year Ellsworth Kelly, Louise Nevelson, and, and Jackson Pollock. And, you know, so it was a perfect opportunity to kind of elevate that color within this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think having had the opportunity to, you know, hear you speak about the in progress black medallion pieces, and um, you kindly shared in process photographs from your studio. Um, it was just really inspiring to be able to think about these other relationships to the Anderson Collection works. Um, and to think about them from a formal perspective in relation to, you know, to shape and to color, um, the Ellsworth Kelly being, you know, a, a perfect example, the, the, the Purrier as well. I think there's also this relatedness of craft, of the, of the, of the hand, of the, um, the facility with which, you know, both Eamon and um, Purrier, you know, are able to really model their, with their materials. Um, yeah, and I also really liked when, when you had mentioned, you know, like Jackson Pollock, when he created that uh, totem piece. Yeah. He had been exposed to Gabriel. I mean, not Gabriel Orozco. Um, um, Jose Clemente Orozco, yep. and and the Me Mexican muralist. Mm -hmm. And and it's an interesting piece. It's a really mm -hmm. early piece of Pollock that has, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't doesn't fit into the 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 what we all kind of think of when we think of Jackson Pollock. Mm -hmm. um, and then Louise yeah, Devilson, the, yeah, you yeah, had mentioned the, the too that she had been in Mexico and yeah, yeah, she yeah she had taken. Um so in the 1930s, Louise Nevelson had had the opportunity to uh, work on a mural project. She met Diego Rivera and uh, Frida Kahlo um, in New York working on a mural project. And they, um, you know, and she had an opportunity to work as a younger artist um, on, on completing that mural um, and took inspiration, I think, from that action as well as other learnings um, and traveled to Mexico and to Guatemala um, in the 1940s and the 1950s. and. Um, really to study pre-Columbian works and to study um, uh, textiles and came back uh, to the States and really launched off on this new series of wooden constructions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, those are, you know, for Pollock, I think we think about his connections to, to, to the muralists and, and Siqueiras and, and others, but maybe less so these days. And certainly with Nevelson, that's not a history that's necessarily brought up. You know, we talk yeah. about New York, we talk about post-war, we talk about that. Um, and I think your work in very many ways is also trying to bring up these ideas that um, have been forgotten or these influences. Yeah, that have also I mean, been I, forgotten. I think it's funny as an artist, it's like you, you don't necessarily like you know, set out, you're not like, put it on my backpack, I'm going to go set out to change art history, you know, like, um, but, but I definitely, like, I feel like the simple act of prioritizing different histories is, like, where that starts to happen, and, and being able to be given this platform in order to create that conversation, I think is, like, the way that it's kind of, to me, the highest form of art. You know, it, it's it's the it's um, it's a platform in, in 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 which we can engage theoretically about our history, you know, and, and how to prioritize things. And um, when I think about that Jackson Pollock piece, actually, like I think about, you know, 
I think me and him probably share a certain uh, share a certain penchant for the gothic in some ways you might not mm -hmm. sense it from my work mm -hmm. but he you know I, the fact that he worked with or was close to Siqueiros and and to Orozco which who for me is like mm -hmm. my favorite Orozco is mm -hmm. um, because he's very Mexican goth mm -hmm. you know it's like it's it's the darker side of the history of 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 colonialism and of Mexican history, yeah, the pre, the post re Mexican Revolution, there, right. history right. and all the energy and yeah, terror. less of the Diego Rivera kind yeah. of a little bit. R R Rivera is kind of idealizing a certain past, mm -hmm. and Orozco's mm -hmm. kind of exposing a bit more of the problematic elements of both the indigenous and the Spanish mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I think that, like to me, I, I don't know. There's something about like I see that piece of Pollux and like, kind of identify with it on some level, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I think that um, there's a lot more that we could be talking about. I think yeah. that um, there are opportunities that we have as well to welcome a couple of students to ask uh, some questions of you as well. Um, you know, this residency is one that um, gives us an opportunity to bring you to campus to engage with art with with other artists to engage with collections but also to engage with the uh, with the university community um, and we've had less opportunity to do that than we had initially imagined for all the obvious reasons um, but we have a couple of students here tonight Anna and Anastasia who um, will be asking some questions um, so feel free to join us when you're ready um, Oh, there you are. I can't see you. Awesome. <laughs> Yay, Sorry. my first Come interaction in. with students. <laughs> Come on up. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. My name is Anastasia Del Rio. I am a freshman studying chemical engineering, and I am originally from Warner Robins, Georgia. So I have a question I would like to ask you. Sure, yeah. As a Chicana, I found there is a weird balance between my Mexican identity and embracing my indigenous heritage. I'm curious how art has influenced your journey of decolonization. What does it mean for you to decolonize artwork in your own craft and in context of the larger art world? Mm. We could do that. We could cover that question in a couple hours. We'll, we'll, um, we'll get Eamon to come back yeah, <laughs> another yeah. time as well. Um, I think like, um, in terms of, you know, how I think it, it, my cousin's here, actually. So I see you. Yes. Uh, um, we, you know, I think about family and I think about like indigeneity and, and for me, I'm Peruvian, so I'm, but I was raised around Chicano culture on the border, Tucson, Arizona, and, and I have family in Mexico as well and have lived, you know, long periods in Mexico. Um, I think it is difficult in terms of like, we're, what we're always looking through, like I have no, I have zero answers, but, <laughs> but, I, but I am looking through something, you know, and what I'm looking through is this kind of, almost if you could think of it as a glass with a lot of fractures in it. And in that fractured, image is all of these different pieces to us you know and and so i think you know it is probably it, it it's you said weird i think you used the word weird yeah because the i think there's this in especially in the united states there's so many le levels to indigeneity and there's also like a, a, a desire to kind of freeze indigeneity in this kind of amber, you know, and and it it loses its generative power, and I think now there's a new generation of people that are are actually shaking a lot of that off, you know, and um, you see it in in that that Hulu series Reservation Dogs. That's more of a Native American experience, but in Latin America, even I think there's a strong desire to to decolonize ourselves in some ways, you know, and, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean, it, I don't think people necessarily think they're not, um, 
you know, um, naive about it, thinking that you can just, you know, I'm decolonized now. I'm done. You know, like, I only eat corn. And, <laughs> like, but I think it's, it, it's more of an exploration, you know, and it's about um, prioritizing certain perspectives, you know. And I think in terms of, like, my own experience, because that's, you know, the, the only thing I can kind of, speak to is for me was two two artists were really huge in terms of my sense of myself as an artist of color and 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 also um one was carlos villa who's a filipino artist in bay area um he was my mentor in the early 90s and he i really like the like the older I get, the more I see how much his impact was. Um, he very much looked into his Filipino history and and it's about form, you know, ultimately it's about form, like what I'm engaging in. Um, it's it's and in that simple act of looking at form and and creating new forms, that's the that that's to me my connection to kind of, um, decolonization in some ways and so so Carlos Villa I think was a huge had a huge impact on me in terms of thinking about that but he was also super in his moment you know it's not that I think the thing that is a slippery slope is just feeling like maybe you don't always be focused on the past you know you want to think about the future and and so there there's there's this constant kind of conversation and struggle in that you know um, and I think also um, Josue Sanchez Serron is an artist who I worked with in Peru in late 90s, 98. Uh, he's from the town that, that our family is from, uh, Huancayo, Peru. And he, I worked with him on murals, and he was kind enough to let me crash at his house and make paintings with him and kind of observe how he practiced, what a real you know practicing artist was and he he gave me a closer connection to kind of what i was looking for like my my roots in some ways um and 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 gave me a, a little bit of like that kind of streets knowledge you know and that was always something that carlos via always said too he was like streets knowledge you got to have streets knowledge you know, that's how you learn art you know um so to me that's i don't know if that totally encapsulates it but that's that's my connection to like, like the ideas of indig indigeneity. You know, I don't necessarily feel like I need to dress in a certain way, or but I but I connect with it in a different way. You know, and I think it's all an individual thing. And and in Latin America, w w we're living so many different histories. You know, I hope that that was <laughs> it was uh, illuminating. <laughs> Yeah, um, my name's Anna. Um, I'm also a freshman from Georgia, actually, and uh, I was going to ask, um, in class we've been discussing a lot about the purpose of art and how art relates to its audience. And so has there ever been an interpretation of your art that has surprised you? Um, what do you hope people will resonate with in your work? Hmm, yeah. I... I think um, I think the thing that this body of work in particular, because it's a bit more inviting to the viewer, um, the things that I'm surprised by are when the work is exposed to a bigger audience. And so people who don't necessarily know what I'm re referencing um, they still identify with it somehow you know and to me that that kind of shows that there's something else at work here that it's not just all about me you know and my experience it's also like tapping into that connection essentially um, and I don't know if it's you know there's certain elements of uh, the fact that it's simple shapes and forms and not figurative 
but maybe that broadens the audience in some ways. And so I'm always surprised when the work is exhibited in different contexts. Um, and, and it doesn't quite, I don't feel like it always has to be tethered to the conversation I'm having with the histories that we've been talking about tonight. You know, I, I am fine with somebody that has no sense of what that history is, appreciating it in their own way. You know, I'm definitely curious how they would, how they would read it. Um, I think that was one part of the question. I, I can't remember what the second one part was. No, uh, that was all of it. Uh, yeah, okay. that was like, what does, uh, what do you hope people Oh, what do I hope? With? Yeah, I hope, yeah. I hope that especially in this exhibition, that you know, reading the text, um, thinking about these connections, that that um, art history is not always fixed. You know, it's not art history is constantly like just spilling out across things, um, and it's really hard for a lot of people in the arts to understand that. Sometimes they really want things categorized. Um, I just want to let people know in the audience that there's an opportunity to ask questions. So um, think of one or come up with one, and um, you have a chance um, very soon. If not now, maybe someone's ready. Do we have a microphone that we'll use in the audience? Oh, cool, we got Ileana's got it. Ileana, I think maybe in the second row there were a few hands up. It's hard to see I know, you get, so. I feel interrogated a little yeah. bit. Well. <laughs> now I see you guys. <laughs> Hi, so my name is Sasha Samuels, and I'm um, a painter and ironically a goldsmith. Oh. Ah. Um, cool. And have been studying with um, a Jungian analyst who does art therapy, so like digging into transmutation and all of that. So this is a treat. And I was introduced to your work about a week ago and came to the top of the stairs at the Anderson Collection and saw that, you know, epic piece. And um, I spent a lot of time in Italy, that's kind of my North Star, mm -hmm. and uh, lived in a, in a church, an abandoned church that was about 700 years old uh, as a house, and that was my art studio. So when I saw your work, the first thing I thought of was the spiritual aspect that goes beyond any denominations. To me, it was powerfully humanistic and really mm -hmm. timeless. So I wanted you to just have that feedback. Um, and then also a technical question. I'm looking at this massive piece of linen. How did you technically pull that off? Yeah, um, that's incredible, um, that connection that you made to it, you know, and that's, that's part of, like, what we were mentioning before, is, like, you know, that's, like, witnessing um, somebody from a totally different background understanding the language. Um, in terms of the, the linen, they, it, that's the maximum size, actually. <laughs> yeah. So it, I think it goes to 120 some inches. Um, I did this try to hunt down. 10 by, 10 by 15 feet, 10 e feet by 15 feet. Yeah, so. I recently did a, 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 large, a larger work, and I was trying to avoid having to make it into a diptych. And I went through every supplier like around the world. And one person in Los Angeles said, oh, there's an artist that, you know, they did have a custom loom made to expand it past the, the max that they do. Um, but it cost $250,000. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're, <laughs> if you're in the market for that, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is a specific question about the, uh, the, the your black medallion series. You've got the deep space black and the beautiful midnight blue. And then at 12 o'clock, you've got one or more of these teardrop shapes that you put pastel shapes in. Yeah. So if you don't look at them sharply, they look like mother of pearl. Uh, I was wondering if you could say something about those. Yeah, so um, the exhibition that I had back in May, um, a solo exhibition that I had at, at James Cohan in New York um, spoke to that motif in the center of, of the canvas and 
it is a teardrop type shape and the title of the exhibition was the symmetry of tears and um you know to me i i it's it's this uh it's this form this motif this shape that kind of like uh distills the emotional content of the painting in some ways um and and the fact that it can be split right down the middle and contain these different forms that at the same time retain its overall shape and, and identity is to me what what I think you know I'm also somewhat interpreting these paintings you know I'm not always understanding everything in absolute in terms you know and and so for me that that's what that that motif has kind of come to signify in a lot of ways um, I've also heard from other people that to them it's it's referenced uh, flame, you know, you have a candle, you know, and, and I think the piece at the top of the stairs really does actually start to, when, when the reds are involved, it starts to really give off a bit more of this kind of, uh, you know, this il illuminating feeling. But the, but the original concept for that form was more rooted in an in, in emotional kind of, distillation of the piece yeah and it definitely speaks to sort of like the alchemical goals and properties I mean the sort of like the sense of the crucible that would be heated and maybe turn red yeah yeah and that piece like going back looking at the early works in the series and kind of using those as like a reference for that large work at the top of the stairs there is almost like a set they're almost like jewels set within a certain kind of form in the middle and so I, I do like that relationship I like to think of these things as as mechanical in some ways you know. so walking up the stairs your big picture at the top is incredibly rhythmic it's like walking into a rock band <laughs> and walking through your gallery a power chord is the incredible thing that I felt was the harmony between all the pictures. And I, I was really interested in your comments about music and how you brought that into the pictures. And I just think there's just an incredible display that the Anderson has done a super job of putting it all together. Yeah, thank and I, you. I'd like to thank you for allowing us to visit and, and to hear your... Uh, you know, when I looked at it, I had no thought of Spanish uh, gold coins, yeah. but the art stands for itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without any explanation. It is an incredible uh, grouping and harmonious group of art. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I mean, just maybe to close it out, you know, that's essentially that's to me what gets me very excited about working in this format is that it's you may not have thought of the connections to the Spanish coin, but, you know, it's, it's a vehicle in which we can engage in these kind of concepts and theories, and, you know. Um, and so it's, it's there to kind of spark that, you know. Well, thank you, Eamon, so very much. Um, thank you for sparking all that you have with us. Um, Anna and Anastasia, thank you both. Yeah, I'm so excited that this show is only one week old, and uh, I get a chance to spend more time with it. I hope you all will as well. The museum tonight remains open until 8 p.m. for anybody who would like to return. Um, there's a great place to stand on the bridge on the second floor, which I think allows you to sort of take in the sonic harmonies of those three areas, the um, the, the painting at the top of the stairs and the, the two corner galleries. So. Um, or just grab the bench, which is where I found Eamon um, on installation yeah, day, sitting at the top of the stairs. Nice so um, do come back. Um, thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you for your participation. Um, and thanks to everybody who, for supporting us. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.